Hey folks, welcome to the Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. I have another great interview for you. In uh, this episode, I talked to Tori Douglas, who does the podcast White Homework. And I know I usually try to do some kind of intro for these episodes, but I'm just going to send you right over to this one because it was so much fun and Tori was such a brilliant guest. Um, and not that my other guests haven't been brilliant and not that nothing has happened over the last two weeks, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tori was a brilliant guest and, and it was a lot of fun. Having it. Okay, I know I said I wasn't going to do an intro, but I, 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 a lot of stuff has happened actually. And it's all been relatively recent. <clears throat> I The most recent Red Reviews is out with uh, Nino Brown and Justin. Uh, we talk about a book from the PSL about, uh, like, that's the Party for Socialism and Liberation. We talked about the book Revolutionary Education. Now, whether you feel one way or another about the PSL, that book is uh, a great resource for people who are looking at uh, a more radical, uh, revolutionary way of uh, approaching education. It's, it's a, uh, I think it's a great resource, and I think that Nino is a great guest, and Justin is an amazing person. Uh, I know that there's a lot of anarchists who have a lot of uh, information that they. Uh, have sent my way about uh, the PSL and I haven't had a chance to go through it yet, but I will. And, uh, and I don't know what conclusion I'm going to come to. I know Justin is an amazing person and he's a great co-host and uh, I'm not going to really say anything bad about him or the party that he belongs to. Uh, I don't know what to say about it, except that if that means I'm not uh, cool in your books, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I'm going to have to just live with that. Um, the, there was another thing there uh, that somebody posted uh, in the comments under the uh, the video for the revolutionary education. And it was in one of these Facebook groups that I'm in. And they posted a link to a video by somebody named Mark Passio. And it was fake ass anarchists. And I mean, it was clearly, it was a shot at me uh, because this person thinks that I'm not a real anarchist. But I listened, I watched this video by Mark Passio and this guy is a reactionary. Uh, he's a conservative. He's a, a hardcore Christian fundamentalist who believes that Satan is trying to take over the world. He's a conspiracy theorist on the level of Alex Jones. He's uh, interviewed David Icke or been interviewed by David Icke, who is the who is the dude who believes that uh, <laughs> reptiles run the world, rep, uh, reptile people rule the world. Like, it's just not a person I'm going to take seriously. Uh, your fake ass anarchist video, it's nonsense. And when I pointed that out, uh, obviously the commenter said, well, I thought he nailed you pretty good. And, and, and the fact is that, yeah, I am a, I am an anarcho communist and left wing anarchists are, are the, are actually anarchists. Like, if you are a centrist anarchist, I can see you, I, I can see you dis disavowing uh, say capitalism and the state and not having, not wanting to be a communist or not wanting to assign yourself with like pro social movements per se. I can get that. But if you're an anarcho capitalist, if you're a capitalist, you aren't an anarchist. And I, I don't know how many times I have to go through this. I'm going to start a series where I, I explain and examine, uh, different types of anarchism in, the simplest terms I can possibly do it in. Uh, I, I know that there's lots to cover. There, it would pay, take hours and hours and hours of content to cover all the different kinds of uh, anarchist. But there, there are certain fundamental core things to all anarchists. And if you are a capitalist, you can't have them. Uh, if you are pro-capitalist, you can't have them. And if you're a reactionary, you're not an anarchist. Uh, I'm sorry, that's just not how it works. <laughs> Uh, I get frustrated because I don't like gatekeeping. I don't like to say so-and-so is an anarchist, so-and-so isn't an anarchist. And I, I've explained this multiple times why anarcho-capitalists aren't anarchists. Because they're proprietarians. They believe in private property. And the ownership of private property leads to the state being replaced by those with land. <laughs> it's like It's like replacing the state with a king and saying, oh, That'll do. It's, I'm sorry, it, it's not, that's not how it works, right? Like what you're, what you're doing is corporate feudalism, not, <laughs> not a free society of free people. And, and I, I just can't take you seriously as an anarchist. And I think this is an issue that we have on multiple levels. Like, sure, maybe it's not a big deal for, uh, for the odd person to encounter, uh, anarchism from these capitalists, uh, from these, uh, 
pro-authoritarians who just use the aesthetics and term anarchist. And, and may, maybe it's not a big deal at all. But for me personally, if I had been a more vulnerable person, like the first person I encountered online who said they were an anarchist was Stefan Molyneux, who is a white supremacist and a hardcore reactionary. But he, he, he used the libertarian line, right? And he was an MRA and, and like all this shit. And if I had been a more vulnerable person, person at that time, if I had been less uh, critical, less of a critical thinker, then I might have fallen for his version of anarchism. And this is a real problem. We need, I think, more voices out here pointing out what anarchism is supposed to be. I know on Twitter, there's a lot of anarchists and hell, I can have it so that my entire feed is just anarchists uh, in the same way that I can have my feed set up so that it's only showing me feminists or only showing me anti-racists and never seeing anything outside of that except through uh, quote tweets or what have you. And I can do the same thing on Facebook and I can, I can join my Discord communities and I can stick it, stay in those and not go out of them and not encounter these people. But Stefan Molyneux had a, has a, a big following or did have a big following. I don't know if he still does. Uh, this guy, Michael Malice, that a lot of anarchists, quote unquote anarchists, uh, uh, follow. <laughs> he's a capitalist. He's a reactionary. He's a MAGA head. Like you can't be a fascist and an anarchist. You just can't. So he's lying to people, but also he's adopting the name and aesthetics of anarchism. And that can confuse people and lead them down the wrong path, a less socially good path, a less pro humanity path. Um, and it, it really concerns me. I really, I really hope that we can get more people going in more places to where they can learn about real anarchism. Uh, my friend uh, Rene, uh, some of you might remember if you watched some of the longer episodes uh, in the Ask an Anarchist sec section, he brought up Michael Malice because when he Googled anarchism, that's who came up. And Michael Malice is a shithead, as far as I can tell. Like, I know I don't know these guys, whatever, but the stuff he puts out is harmful misinformation. It's harmful and it's, it's backwards thinking. It's straight up status quo capitalist free market nonsense. <laughs> and it's just without states. Like it's just pure bullshit. So then you also have, uh, like this, this Mark Passio who is, I mean, I didn't go that far into his shit. I've just kind of, I just sc skimmed the surface of it, but he seems like exactly the opposite of what an anarchist is. And yet he's using the term anarchist and he's, he's actually applying like he get a, a, a strategy that says he gets to pick who's an anarchist. He gets to dictate that. He puts himself as an authority on what an anarchist is. So I think it's, I think it's scary and harmful. And if we want an actual anarchist society, then this is the misinformation we have to, uh, we have to tackle. Um, I've often said like that I would like to see, uh, more people addressing the misinformation that Joe Rogan puts out because he's uh he's a well-known person he's got a mainstream platform with millions of viewers but mark passio has 123,000 youtube subscribers he's got a, a radio show he's got a podcast with thousands and thousands and thousands of downloads and these people they all are getting the wrong idea about what anarchism is so it is a problem i know i know some people think that it's not a big deal but uh it is a problem. Misinformation is a major, major problem. And it's something that we have to find a way as a community, in my opinion, to uh, address. So for something I wasn't going to say anything about, that, that came out a lot longer than I had intended. But uh, before I send you over to the interview, I just want to say thank you for watching or listening to this. And uh, thanks for sharing this around if you do. And thanks. That helps get more views and more listeners. And maybe if we're lucky, uh, we, can, <laughs> we can show people that anarchism is different than what these uh, reactionary shitheads say it is. <laughs> so uh, this show is available on all the podcast places as well as YouTube. And I stream on Twitch whenever I get the chance. I also have to thank everyone who supports this show. You can see their names on the end screen in the video, which uh, if you're listening on a podcast... It's just going to be, that's when there's two minutes or so of music is. That's when the names are scrolling up through the screen. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you don't mind. It's wonderful music by my friend, David Roman. Uh, if you want to support me, then you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist and sign up for $1 per month. Or if you're in Canada, it's $1.50, I think. Uh, that gets you access to a special patron chat room on the Discord server, as well as extra long videos, uh, the occasional early access, 
and of course, my deep and heartfelt thanks. Uh, if you want to contribute but don't want to commit to a monthly payment, then you can do that at, at uh, buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty for a one-time contribution. And if you can't afford to do any money, then just share the show around. Give it a thumbs up or a uh, on YouTube or a five-star rating or a review on the podcast app of your choice, as well as Podchaser is a great place to go give ratings and reviews of podcasts. There's a link in the show notes or the uh, description box down below where you can do that. And besides that, thank you so much for being here and on to the interview. All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm talking to Tori Williams Douglas from White Homework. <laughs> Hi. How's it going? Thanks. Oh, it's good. How thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I wasn't really sure. I was like, where am I from? Like, is this I'm like, I'm from Portland. Uh, which is, you know, it's currently burned down, as you can see. There's nothing left. So yes. um <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I was like, oh yeah, I'm like, I do, <laughs> I do all these things. Where am I from? So anyway, hi. Well, yes. yeah, I, I know you from white homework, which is uh, a podcast I listen to, uh, whenever it comes out, like yes. I, I, it, I put it up to the top of my playlist. So <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I there's, think... a, there's a new episode out today. Oh, nice. About That's reverse awesome. racism. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's an important one. There's uh -huh. still a lot of people talking about like, as if that's a thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> that's fun. So, yeah. A couple of the ones that I, uh, the most recent ones, like I really enjoyed your one about defending running away from the police. Yeah. I think yeah. It, I, th I thought it was really valuable. Like, uh, <laughs> the idea that we're all supposed to be calm when there's a gun pointed at us. Right. So it's like nobody nobody would be calm in that situation, right? Yeah. And that's not and it's not de-escalation using psychological violence to get somebody to get people to like calm down. Um which, No, that's right. Which is, you know, because I try, you know, I try to having conversations with whoever, folks are very often like, well, but the police like they're armed because they have to be able to de-escalate a situation. I'm like, there is no context in which <laughs> like in the U S like an armed officer is de-escalation. That's just because yeah, they, they no. have, they have the legal right to like execute any of us just because they feel away. So. Yep. That's right. It's a, uh, a gun in the situation is the opposite of de-escalation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I didn't even mention this, but thinking about like nurses get assaulted way more often than cops do, right? Like right. teachers also get assaulted and managed to deal with that without shooting their students. So like what's yep. missing? <laughs> yeah. I often think of like, uh, like this, uh, special education teachers who mm -hmm. are dealing with, uh, behavioral issues. Yeah. They, they have to talk yeah. their students down all the time and mm -hmm. they don't use guns to do it. No. <laughs> like, is this an effective tool for what I'm trying to accomplish? Yeah. I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. So I guess we kind of skipped over it, but uh, I guess I'll get you to maybe tell people a little bit about yourself and yeah. Uh, your shows. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't even know where to start, but I was like raised fundamentalist Christian um, here in uh, the Pacific Northwest. Okay. And, um, they have fundamentalist Christians in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. <laughs> and they think that they're being persecuted because there aren't that many of them. Oh, so that's also okay. very special. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so yeah, like wasn't allowed to attend school, like, and you know, I had really no access to anything that wasn't explicitly Christian. Um, but you know, Portland, like every major city, has a bunch of racism. And that was something that I <laughs> noticed as a child, like as a little kid, it was very clear to me that like there were a disproportionate number of the people who were experiencing crisis that I'd be like, we'd just drive past on, on the street or like I'd see on the bus or whatever the situation was, um, who looked like me and, and my family. 
compared to the like very, very rarely seeing there were just there weren't that many black folks in Portland at the time. Okay. There's still not. We were also lived in a part, you know, my mother is like a raging white supremacist. So oh, no. um, yeah, it's yeah, it's a small problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> that so, sounds that's yeah, that's a problem. Wow. Um, so we uh we lived in we lived as far away from like the bad part of town as we could. Okay. Um but it was still absolutely something that I that I noticed all the time. And you know, I was given very um unsatisfactory answers for why these disparities existed. Right. Um and you know, so like politically, ideologically, I was pretty conservative. Um, you know, kind of up like through my 20s. It was like mid 20s when I started like moving away from that. Okay. And uh, the reason for that actually was data on outcomes for uh, black mothers giving birth. In the U.S., you're like black moms are about three times as likely to die um, right. from complications uh, during or following childbirth. And um, I you know, I was like, I was raised in this like pro-life anti-choice situation. I'm like, how come nobody's talking about this? Like whose, whose lives matter exactly? Like what is, what's going on here? Um, <laughs> it does seem uh, <laughs> when something disproportionately affects uh, black folks, it does tend to get ignored. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Oh, is it like that in Canada too? No way. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you know, looking like, so I was like going through all of this data and, and trying to figure out, cause I was like, there's no, I'm like, there's no way that this is just racism, right? Like there has to be something else going on. And it's like, oh, like people controlled for all of these different things, including the fact that like doctors spend less, like obstetricians spend less time with their black patients. Like they're, right, they're, right. they're less likely to listen to their black patients. And so if you're not responsible, you know, if you're not getting right. a response, if nobody is advocating for you that that your you know healthcare providers choose to listen to, um, yeah, it's a huge gonna, yeah. it's a huge problem, and nobody had any answers for me for that, and so it was really like data that moved me away from. For sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, it turns out it actually is racism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. You never yeah. handled that. So why do you think it went away? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> weird. Very weird. Um, yeah, in, in yeah. Canada, we have definitely that. Uh, and also, like, almost cases where uh, if Indigenous women go into the hospital, sometimes they will get uh, treatment that, and they will, if they got the proper treatment, they would be alive. Right. And instead, they are dead. Yeah. Uh, because of the, the way that, nurses talk about them and mistreat them and assume they're drug addicts and, and stuff like that. Like, it's just like, obviously racism, but then right. nobody wants to be accountable. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, it's, I mean, it's very similar here, like, um, indigenous women, pro I mean, in most, in most ways that can be measured have, have worse outcomes than black women. Um, and you know, like, Kind of seems like as survivors of genocide, maybe we should prioritize them and their safety, well-being. Just you know, a thought. Seem, this seems legitimate to me. Yeah, that right? seems like a good so, idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So this is like all of my kind of kind of background, and then okay. there were there were several things that really kind of uh, struck me. Um, one of them was, was the Sandy Hook shooting, right? Cause everybody in my world was pro gun, no, of course. kind of, kind of like pro gun, no matter what okay. situation. And so that was another thing where I was, you know, I just like, had, I found myself in this pro gun camp, which, you know, it's like, everybody says, if you go far enough left, you get your guns back. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I, you know, so I started looking at that, at this data because there is there is some researching researching gun safety and gun deaths in the U.S. is illegal. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, cool. They don't actually collect some of that data. <laughs> right. No. And, and you can't get any federal funding for it at all. It's illegal yeah. for the federal government to fund this, this research. So it's like private money, essentially, like, like, like people's foundations that fund this research. And it was like, oh, there's, there's very clearly ways to like minimize harm around right. guns and gun ownership and children and like all of these different things. And we're just ignoring it. Choosing not to do those things. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And it's still, it, uh, to me, it's like, you still get to go to the range every weekend. Like, what do you want exactly? <laughs> like, <laughs> this is yeah. a, but. I don't really understand it myself. Like, even even though I have moved, uh, as I've moved far, farther left, I've moved a little bit on my gun yeah. uh, view, right? But I'm still not a person who understands gun culture or cares right. about guns. Like, right, right. <laughs> so. Well, you have a personality, so you don't need to. <laughs> like, oh, buddy, your personality <laughs> must be so small. Right. So, eh? Oops. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I just, just, that's, I think that's kind of the difference, right? Is it's like, I, I feel like people on the left, it's like, we don't have to make that our entire identity. Yeah. Cause yeah. it's not, it's like, it's a tool. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. It, it can be useful in some situations, not useful in others. <laughs> yep. Yeah, <laughs> totally. So this is another situation where like data is really kind of moving me further left um, right. yeah. without, without it being like a political thing. I was just, I was like, I hate, I hate it's like, do your own research. Right. But I was, I was doing other people's research. Like I was reading like peer reviewed, published right. journal yeah. articles, I'm not doing <laughs> do my your own, own research. research on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, There's a big difference. Eh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So I think that like, for me, really the, the catalyst, when I talk about this on the podcast and, you know, in like essays that I've written and, and things like that was, um, Michael Brown being murdered Mm -hmm. and the Ferguson uprisings. And that was kind of like the, oh, I'm not wanted in this space Mm -hmm. moment. Right. And it's like, okay, so all the people I know are like, oh, apparently they'd be cool with it. If like, the cops shot my brother for maybe stealing a pack of cigarettes or like right. writing, writing a bad check. Like they think this is a net positive. Right. And that, it was like, that mm, seems, yeah, mm-mm. that sounds like a pretty toxic environment to be in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so that was, that was kind of where I was like, okay, this is, this is not working for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not working right. for any of us. Like, uh, but yeah, it was, you know, in the U S I think really since Obama got elected conservatives and especially evangelicals have been really like circling the wagons in terms right. of, um, being in this kind of very defensive posturing, even when they're in charge of everything. So it's like, they, there's just, there's so much, it's, it's so much more like you're in or you're out. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, there used, there used to be like more of a spectrum. And now it's like, if you didn't vote for Trump, you're not one of the real ones, like get out. Wow. Um, yeah. So <laughs> it, it, this was, this is all like culturally like stuff that was happening, but, but that really like the Ferguson uprising was, that was like the catalyst. Cause I started paying attention to that. And I also saw like how the people that I knew personally, responded to that and so it was just like oh okay i'm i guess i'm gonna go <laughs> i guess yeah like <laughs> what what other response would one ha- could one have i guess is like uh yeah self-hatred i suppose i suppose i suppose yeah unfortunately <laughs> yeah I participate in the in the uh, racist culture mm-hmm. i guess mm-hmm. yeah yeah which you know kind of pays well if you like, it sure seems like it. Yeah. If, if you can get, if you can, if you can like get yourself in a place where you can make money off of it. Not to name any names, but there, there are people. Not who to name that. names. No. <laughs> um, so what started the uh, podcast? The podcast was, um, okay. Let me think about how this, how this shook out first. So essentially what I 
wanted to do was, um, you know, I, I was on, like, I was just very on Twitter and folks would like see what I was talking about. And I'd get all of these DMS about like, Hey, I don't, you know, I don't want to be racist. I want to like, try, you know, I want to try to learn and be receptive and what do I do? Okay. And cool. I, I was like, well, I, I don't know you, so I don't know what you should do. <laughs> like, uh, I, that's not something I can just intuit over the internet. Um, <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> so I, so I, um, put together these like little white homework lessons so that people could go and like do their own stuff, like do their own work and find out like the history of the places that they have lived and like the history of the industries that they've worked in and, and what kinds of exclusionary policies and not even exclusionary policies, but just like functional exclusion, even without right. policy around it um, have impacted how far they've gotten in life. And, um, yeah. so with the podcast I wanted to do was I really wanted to have, um, I really, because I like, I grew up in, in poverty, like my parents eventually like kind of managed to scrape their way out of that. Uh, but that was obviously it's a really stressful situation. It is hard on, it's extremely hard on kids. It's extremely hard on people trying to feed kids. Um, yeah, and yep. so what I wanted to do was pay rent for a family of color for a year. Um, because I just knew like, and again, there's boatloads of data that show that like just giving people cash, like helps yep. a lot. Yep. Um, so I was like, I want to like, I want to fund this thing. So I'm going to start you know, white homework as, as a podcast. Right. And just like set up my Patreon so that I can pay rent for these families. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's kind of where it came from. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Like, uh, there's a couple of, uh, projects that I know of, uh, around here that are like, uh, uh, what is it? Pay, pay your rent where, where mm. you use settlers pay rent to indigenous communities <laughs> for our, possession or, yeah. or you know our stolen possession of their land right <laughs> it's really interesting and it goes towards you know people who need it yeah yeah Which absolutely is, i think we, great we, projects we have we have we have uh there are organizations here in in the states that do that too and you know i like i i throw money in because i know that some of my ancestors got free shit because i don't know guns and <laughs> God and you're not using it. So it's ours. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's something that I, that I put money into every month also, because it's like, yeah, it's, it's stolen land and you need yeah. to, you need to make amends for that somehow. Somehow. <laughs> Since those in power don't want to actually participate in any kind of true mm -hmm. reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <sighs> and it's, it's, I think that the thing like in the States at least is that's so interesting to me is the way that so many white folks here would rather suffer than have like healthcare that everybody can access. <laughs> it's a really weird phenomenon. To me. It's, it is, it's like objectively <laughs> bizarre, right? That they're like so committed to this ideology that doesn't serve them that they, right willingly like I, I talk about this book all the time on the podcast but um dying of whiteness by oh, jonathan yep. metzel is really really good and um yeah he taught he's but he talks about this is like the way you know those in some of his research you know having conversations with older white men who can't access health care and are you know have perfectly have perfectly normal conditions that like any kind of access would allow them to survive and have many more healthy, happy years. And they're just like, no, I don't Forget want it. that. What, it's <laughs> like, what if the illegals get it? Like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you talking? It's not like, I mean, everything is pie, right? So it's like, if anybody else gets anything, they get nothing. Right. Yeah. It's always, it's always a win, a, Yes. A total loss, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's mm -hmm. win lose, one hundred percent. If you got it, yes. then I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just like again, that's not 
that's not how healthcare works. You can, you can, you can just train people to be It's not doctors. really how anything works. This is not really how anything <laughs> works, right? <laughs> this, <laughs> this one conversation though, that's like so stuck in my head is just like, that's, mm-mm. like that's not right. how it works. Like we can just, we can make more healthcare. Yeah. I Shocking. think of like, uh, like before the, I guess it was the 2020 election mm. uh, when Bernie Sanders, w- it was the primaries uh, still. And mm-hmm. they were, I think it was the New York Times was interviewing union reps in Las Vegas. And the oh, union okay. reps didn't want to support Bernie Sanders because they fought so hard for this health care plan for their uh, members of their union. And it was just like, but you'll get better health care. <laughs> <laughs> like, and you won't have to take it out of their paychecks. Like, it's it's a whole thing. <laughs> you fought for a thing that's worse than what you'd get. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 so it's so bizarre the way that it, you know it, it's like oh I just you know I guess I'm gonna I guess I'm gonna shoot myself in the foot because that's the only way to like keep other people from winning the race. Also, like. I, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's so weird. We all get shot in the foot. That's right. what it is. <laughs> that makes it fair. No, it doesn't. This is yeah. not leveling the playing field, you guys. <laughs> it's the opposite. Yes. Mm. Terrible, terrible idea. Yes, truly. Uh, so you actually have uh, another podcast called Go yes. Home Bible, You're Drunk. Yes. So I'm I'm very, I, uh, I came out of, uh, in the I guess 2008, 2009, I was part of the new atheist community. Okay. <laughs> so, so obviously I'm a non-believer. I have lots of opinions about religion, but I, I left that community. Mm. But I, the title of your, your, uh, your other podcast definitely appeals to me still. <laughs> 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 so what is, what is go home Bi- uh, Bible? You're drunk. Um, so that's, podcast uh so jokingly on twitter for for many many years um a lot of like ex evangelicals like former white evangelicals um have jokingly been talking about something along the lines of drunk history but for the bible okay because the bible is full of these incredibly bizarre stories that we just pretend are normal <laughs> 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 right. I mean, it's just as it's just as bizarre as like any other, like the Greek pantheon or Roman or what or whatever, whoever we're talking about. Uh yeah. it's 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 as weird as that shit. <laughs> but like we're just like, oh yeah, this is fun. This is this is this is what we're making policy on. This one right? makes sense though. <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah. we were, you know, in those spaces in church, we were taught to like the Bible was to be taken literally and that the Bible, the Bible was your history textbook and the Bible was your science textbook. Right. And the Bible was your government textbook. And um, <laughs> so we, what we decided to do with the show was we we're like, okay, well let's, let's just read this and take it literally as it's written now that we're not in anymore and just like, see what happens. Right. Um, so yeah, often includes, you know, a favorite beverage, but people, of course, of we, course. we encourage people, you know, lots of people don't drink. It's like, okay, that's cool. Like drink some water, <laughs> do a push up, whatever you, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, but yeah, so we kind of, we kind of do like a mini drinking game, like that's in awesome. the episode. Um, and yeah, the Bible is really weird. Like the Bible is so weird. <laughs> what do you think is probably the most uh, un- bizarre thing that you've uh, gone through? Um, let's see here. Most bizarre. So recently we did the the ten plagues of Egypt. Okay. Which That's is just like chaotic evil. <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> like this God character is constantly like going back and forth. It's like Pharaoh's like, oh, Pharaoh's gonna let let the like enslaved Israelite people go. And then God's like, no, and hardens Pharaoh's heart and like makes okay. him change his mind. And so it's just like this whiplash of like back and forth. And it's, you know, we were talking about, this is the most complicated, convoluted way to do something. Like if you were going to drown <laughs> the entire Egyptian army in the Red Sea, like just do that. 
You don't have to do like <laughs> the frogs and the right. blood. Like you're come gone. On. Like, <laughs> speed it up, buddy. Like, what are you doing? Um, so yeah, that then that um that story was really, really fun. And you know, we do really sincerely try to be respectful of the f- and like a cognizant of the fact that like the way that white evangelicals use the Bible is not like first of all, like they stole two thirds of it <laughs> from another religion and just sort of like this right, is ours right. now. Um yeah. But like, yeah, we try to be really cognizant of the fact that there are like much better interpretations of these things that like you can have conversations about and, and, and like, you can debate like the ethics and the morality and like in the Hebrew scripture is used very differently by the overwhelming majority of, of Jewish people. Right. Right. Then, then evangelicals use their Bible. So, um, it's, yeah, we try to be really aware of the fact that it's like, we're doing a literal reading of, of the thing that they gave us that has little or nothing to do with like actual Judaism. Right. Right. Because except, except like in terms of appropriation and then them being simultaneously obsessed with Israel and extremely anti-Semitic simultaneously. So it's a neat trick. I know. <laughs> Imagine pulling that off. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, cause I, I grew up semi-religious. Okay. Uh, so uh, my, my parents, like they, they made me tithe to uh, Robert Schuler and the crystal cathedral. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> but okay. I was never really like a believer. Like yeah. we watched it on TV every Sunday and, and whatever. Oh. And my, my parents were very like, they believed, but I never really bought into it. Okay. So, uh, so I didn't really read the Bible. <laughs> so, so it's always interesting to me to have other people reading it at, with their perspectives and, and yeah. whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many, it's, it's massive. There's so many stories in there and oh, yeah. all of them are just like complete madness. If you're reading it as like, if you're reading it literally, like as a history textbook, it's like, this is no, y'all <laughs> are that shit off the walls. This is, this makes no sense. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, for sure. (laughs) If you want to believe that, I guess that's good for you. It's like, no, this is bad. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely the way that some people interpret it is very bad, right? (laughs) Yes. There's no getting away from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it just so happens that those are the people who also have political power in the United States. (laughs) They just run all the things. Yeah. <laughs> like theocracy. Here we come. I don't know. Yeah. Like, and they screwed. don't even hide that, right? No, like, <laughs> no. Because it's like traditional family values. It's like, you can't come for that and you can't come for my religion. So if my religious beliefs say that, like, we should just bully, like we should use our political power to bully trans children, then like, we're just going to do that. It's, yeah. This is. And we can take a, bar- okay. a verse out of the Bible yep. and we can justify it. And mm-hmm. now we're doing God's work. Yes. And, and right. that makes us good and not, and not bad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, that kind of like moral framework that they use where it's just like, oh, it's good if we do it yeah. because, because God wants us to do it. But if you do it, like you're bad. Right. Right. Or yeah, because it's... like socialism or Marxism or something. <laughs> They really throw that around a lot, dude. They truly <laughs> do. And they don't really know what it means, no. of course. It's just like, one thing that I did notice over the past, I don't know, probably probably like since around Trump, the time that Trump got elected was uh, when, like online, when conservatives start calling, start referring to something as socialist, everybody like jumps on and they're like, this sounds great, actually. Like, where do I sign up for socialism? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Like, uh, yeah, like this is, we're only doing it this way because it works for you. So. Yeah. Like all this stuff would be better for the rest of us if, if, it were, if that's how we were going to go. But <laughs> it's so I, bad. I, 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 I've lost a lot of friends locally because, uh, in Saskatchewan, okay. uh, everybody hates Justin Trudeau. Fair. And the reason is, be- yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> but for the wrong reasons, the okay. reasons, <laughs> the reason they hate Justin Trudeau is because he's a communist. Oh God. Oh God. <laughs> and, and so I often get online and I'm like, wow, well, 
he's not a communist and communism would be better actually. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, so if like, he was doing a great reset, I'd be in favor of it. Totally. Yeah, I'm like and, he's just, he's a neoliberal. Like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> he's yeah. a communist. Yep. <laughs> like you guys, like words have meanings. That's right. Like at least read the wiki page, please. <laughs> it's all right. It's free. There's not it, even a paywall. You can just right. go look it up. <laughs> you don't have to believe everything it says on there. Just totally. uh, at have least some kind of a frame it. of a frame of reference for like what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh yeah. No, I'm I I totally I totally hear that because yeah, it's I, I've noticed that. Um I probably I probably pay slightly more attention to Canadian politics during non like trucker protest situations uh, <laughs> of course, than, than yes. most than most people in the U S I think but yeah it's it, like the whole oh my gosh yeah just Justin Trudeau is a communist like I mean if he resigns I'm not gonna it's not gonna break my heart right totally like who cares <laughs> but yeah definitely not a communist well then. Thing here is like like white liberals love to kind of turn p- politicians into celebrities and kind of deify right. their faves, right? Whoever they're standing at the moment, um, and so yeah, and they, they absolutely did that with Trudeau. They're doing it with with Vladimir Vladimir Zelensky right now. Yeah, also, it's so weird. Like it's stop. so weird. Stop. <laughs> like you're this is, this is not you are unwell. <laughs> this is your response. <laughs> anyway. No, nope, so for sure. That's yeah. a problem that we have here uh, on, on on the left. We have two. We have two right wing parties. Yeah. No, that's right. Yeah. We have we have two and a center party. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so, like that's I think our conservatives are right, our liberals are right, and the right. NDP are I would consider center, center maybe yeah. center left. Like, yeah. they do have some left ideas. <laughs> No, nobody here does. I mean, no. like there's a handful of people in Congress who do, but you yeah. know, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? <laughs> They're not millionaires. How would they right. even change anything? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Counter propaganda. Yeah. So the thing that you have here is police budgets are being slashed and the assumption is that it increases crime. Mm-hmm. And something I was arguing with a couple of guys the other day was that actually the uh, police budgets weren't even really slashed and crime hasn't changed all that much. Mm-hmm. In fact, in fact, uh, I like I, I tried to appeal to their uh, their st- their desire for evidence and whatnot yeah. And, yeah, and say, absolutely. like, we know through evidence that increased policing does not decrease crime. <laughs> There's like, no correlation there at all. None. It's just a fact. <laughs> <laughs> so are you seeing a lot of people uh, talking about uh, police budgets and, and uh, the defund the police kind of uh, campaign that was going on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 gotten to the point where... Um, they, like there's this whole narrative around like oh we we cut police funding right and and um that's why that's why crime has gone up which you know like at least in, in the states like conservatives and i think maybe white people generally like unless you're pretty far left like you always think crime is going up like <laughs> But well, my it's property on the news. values, right? It's on the news. It can't be wrong. Um, like they're not just reading whatever the police decided to put out as like a PR statement. <laughs> right. Yeah, no. Um, right. So yeah, we um, we obviously had uh, we had a little bit of um, we had a little bit of disruption of our police department uh, here in Portland. Um, and uh, so I, and I think this is like a really good kind of example of, of what's going on in a lot of other cities. Um, so our our police budget was reduced by kind of in the wake of the George Floyd protests. Uh, our police budget was was slashed by three <laughs> percent. Um, <laughs> the big three percent. <laughs> uh-huh. Yes. And so uh, basically we what happened was they got rid of this gang enforcement task force uh 
situation okay. that they have. Uh, Portland doesn't have gangs. So okay. I'm like, this is so I'm like, why you're getting, have that then? <laughs> right. Well, and, and, and it's like, you're like, you're still getting your racism from the 1990s. Like at least get a newer version. You guys like, right. come, like yeah. find something else to be upset about. Um, and like, there's, again, there's no correlation between police funding and crime. Right. Right. <laughs> you know? So then everybody's <laughs> like, well, we have to, we, there's so many murders and like, we have to bring up, we have to bring, give them all of their money back and give them all of their guns and let them racially profile because uh, like everything is falling apart. And, you know, it's like, this is the most, this is the most murders we've had in this, in this city since, I don't know, like 1991 or any two or something like that, which is, you know, <laughs> That's a valid concern. Um, sure. Portland's also like a third or to like 50% bigger than it was then. So right. if you're just looking at like, if you're just looking at the numbers, that's not, that's not quite the whole story right. um, because the city is significantly bigger. And this wasn't like, this was like a local thing, like a lot, like crime, most crime went down. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately like Port portland like the u.s has a gun problem which means we have a murder problem right. and because guns are just like really effective at killing things um so yep. everyone's yeah. like oh cops aren't doing anything because they're so afraid that they're gonna be like pro protested or whatever and it's just like well again like cops aren't they're not de-escalating like they're escalating yeah. these situations so if, if you actually are afraid you wouldn't come into a situation like guns blazing, like screaming in people's faces. It's just right. So yeah, it's uh, seems really, I don't know, counterintuitive to uh, increase the amount of guns that police have. Uh, if you're worried about people being killed. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and like on top of that, they get like free, like military surplus shit yeah. and that they get to like use on civilians because there are no laws if you are a cop in the country. <laughs> didn't uh, like, didn't Joe Biden just increase that too? Like I thought somebody who said uh, that he actually sent more military equipment to uh, police uh, forces around the United States. Well, I, cause they're like, well, what else are we going to do with it? Take it apart. Like, just yeah, that's right. Sell turn, it for scrap. Just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Junk it. Like, <laughs> You don't have you don't have to create manufacture crime in order to use this tank like yeah get rid of it yeah just just decommission it like come right. on <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, I I do not understand people I don't no. no I don't either yeah it's it's a thing about I don't know if it's like normies or, or mainstream people whatever you uh -huh. want to call them like yeah but they've got like They've seen crime on the news. It's all they ever see. They're afraid all the time. <laughs> and they're afraid of black people or indigenous mm -hmm. people more than mm -hmm. anyone else mm -hmm. and poor people, you know. So it's, of course, they want more police, but. Right. Right. And it's like, again, the like crime, I mean, in the U.S., crime, if I recall correctly, crime went up every single year that, that Reagan was in office. Like that was your boy. So I don't under, like yeah. if you think, and he was, he was massively funding the police, right? He was yeah. giving police tons of funding and crime just kept going up. Yep. So uh, yeah, again, like there's no, there's no correlation on like, like an individual, like city level. There's no correlation on a like national or federal level. Like it's just, it's just what cops choose to do. Right. The, and you know, again, here yeah. in the U S they don't even have to solve crimes. So right. Right. <laughs> it's like, Oh, we need more money. It's, you guys are all making six figures. Like to yeah. sit in your little squad car and eat donuts. And what, <laughs> what are you doing? And I think it was like of the most dangerous jobs, like delivery pizza mm -hmm. person is above police officer yeah. for how dangerous their job is. So yeah. maybe they don't need, you know, <laughs> All that body armor. I, I my my one uh, argument was like they actually aren't having like gunfights every day. Right. <laughs> like that's not a thing that happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. so they don't need body armor. They don't need to carry guns and have like assault rifles in their trunk. There's no like, reason. Like like there's no reason to carry a gun if you're giving someone a speeding ticket. No, that's right. That's nuts. 
Yeah. And I, I'm not a person who's against speeding laws. <laughs> right. Fair. Right. I mean, yeah, that's, that's true. Like it's, it is a form of harm reduction. Yeah. Um, cops aren't though. No. So <laughs> whatever the answer is, police are not it. Uh huh. That's true. That's true. I'm like, yeah, everybody, everybody, because of the Oscars is like, violence isn't the answer. I'm like, you are, you like fund the police. So clearly it is. Yeah. <laughs> and actually in that case, I'm fine with it. Fair. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, whatever. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right. We'll go on to uh, foes and comrades. Uh, you, you said you had something very specific to the Portland situation. <laughs> uh-huh. But I, I think we can broaden it out to a, a kind of a white people trying to hold black people accountable Mm-hmm. for various things. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I did, I did see something on Twitter not that long ago about uh, like, um, don't go, like it's better to go to a uh, person like Candace Owens than it is to go to a white person to learn about the black experience. And, okay. and I, I, uh, my, my response was like, I would go to no one. In <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Those are my choices. Like, I'm good. <laughs> like, uh, luckily, we don't have to go to those two people. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I don't even know if that's like, I don't even know if I agree with that just because there are like, there are a lot of wonderful scholars here in the U S who are white folks who are like the ones who are really digging up a lot okay, of the receipts yeah. on um, racist policies and the impacts of, of racist policy, um, the impacts that slavery has. So, I mean, it's, yeah, to me, I'm like, I, like Candace Owens is kind of a unique situation because <laughs> like she's, her family is like Caribbean or something. And so she thinks that she's better than like American black people anyway. So it's just like, there's some chaos there that I'm like, I don't need to, I don't need to get into that. <laughs> um, fair, fair. <laughs> but also like Candace is like, she's not, she's not, she's not holding white people accountable. Like she's no, just no. going, she's like going after black folks. Cause that's like an easy target for her. That's why she's paid the big bucks. I have no idea what she's paid. Like she's she, doing better than a lot of people. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I assume that that is the case. Um, I like, I, I'm mortified thinking about being that wrong that loudly every single day. Like I, that is like, that is my worst fear. It's like, embarrassing. Right? Like how do you, how do you look at yourself in the mirror? Like, my God, woman. Um, yeah. So I think that there is like, that just, you know, in the U S and you know, every, every country has us, you know, every, every colonizer nation has some kind of, has some kind of racism just like built in. For sure. Um, and so when, yeah, when you're talking about people holding like people of the what, whatever majority or people, the people who have power holding other folks right. accountable for things. Um, yeah, I like I really I really struggle with that. Um, the, the specific example that I gave you just briefly was there are some white women in Portland who are trying to hold some black and Muslim community members accountable for, for harm that they, that they feel has been caused. And, um, you know, to the extent of, to the extent of my knowledge, like what, at least one of these individuals has completely owned up to everything that happened. And it was, it's not like a part of their, their life anymore. And, you know, like I, I saw somebody, like someone, I don't, I don't, I don't even think they live here. Like, I don't think they're part of like the activist community here at all, but they had like a really interesting comment about like, you have to, you have to like, you have to go through this process and like kind of make restitution. And, and I'm like, but what does that look like? Because all of these people are saying that, that, that what this was is like taking public accountability for, for your actions, like owning your actions is like not good enough. Mm. So, um, and you know, they admitted they're like, yeah, it's going to look different kind of in every situation. But I mean, the thing, the way that in the U S historically and, and still today that white women like weaponize their innocence, um, like black men get killed over 
that still, yeah. still. Gotcha. And I think like, you know, one of, one of the more acute examples of this, like kind of following um, on the heels of the Me Too movement was like, well, what if, like, what if I get falsely accused? It's like the majority of people who are falsely accused and the accusation sticks are black men being accused by white women. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually, on uh, a recent, uh, a recent uh, conversation I had uh, regarding an Angela, uh, Angela Davis's book, Women, Race and Class, mm-hmm. uh, we, we talked about uh, the, the use of white women as a way to, uh, uh, like kind of as a victimization of yeah. white women in order to perpetuate the idea of black men as perpetrators. Right. And like, it's, it's, it's so common and it's very, very like problematic. And uh, like, I mean, the idea of a Karen has become kind of a joke, right? Right. But yeah. that, that started from white women calling the cops on black men who just happened to be existing near them. Right. Yes. <laughs> Right. So, <laughs> so it's it's deeply, deeply problematic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, truly. I, I mean, and it's again, it's like it hasn't it hasn't really gone anywhere, you know? No. And, and um, you know, and I like like now it people record it, <laughs> post it yeah. on the internet. So um we know it hasn't gone anywhere. Yeah. Uh but yeah, I mean I like absolutely I am a uh huge advocate for like making restitution for, for harm caused as opposed to like yeah. piling more harm on like that doesn't help anybody. Right. Like that doesn't right. get us any closer to like you feeling better. Like I know that you feel like, you know, you need revenge or whatever, but like, let's make right. this right. As yeah. opposed to like, let's just take this out on someone and then you get nothing except like you're in your fields for a while and get to say like, oh, well that like they got what they had coming. Like, you know, give, like yeah. give, make people make it right. <laughs> well, yeah, to, like, exactly. More violence. Well, and we do see that like too with uh, the way that like say a Bill Cosby or an R. Kelly, mm-hmm. uh, when they are facing consequences, the celebration on, on online and in, in mm-hmm. uh, media and <laughs> Again, I, I talked about this not that long ago, and I'm still struggling to come up with a example of a white person who is <laughs> having similar things. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Like it's not – it's when white men do the same things that black men do. Right. Even the guilty ones. Yeah. Like it's still like not the same – and it's not the painted resp- the same way. It's not yeah. treated the same way. Yeah, absolutely. The, yeah, the response is is very different. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, you, people notice that, like people notice when you have these, like, I mean, well, I should say like people of color notice when white people have these very like disparate responses to like whoever's in trouble, um, you know, or whoever is like, who, whoever got caught, I guess is what I should right. say, because that's really like the only metric that we ever use. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's like, it is, it's a very kind of different, it's a very, very different, um, response, like emotional response that, that people have. And, you know, again, like, I, I think if, if, if you as a, as a white woman aren't looking at, looking at yourself and going like, hi, history, Emmett Till, like, this is a real thing. Like that woman is still alive and she hasn't been charged with anything. Um, Mm. So, you know, it it just, to me, like the context matters so much. It's not necessarily that like, it's inherently harmful every single time, like a white woman tries to hold a black man accountable. Right. 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 But you have like the, the larger context in this situation is the way in which that has been weaponized, um, as a justification for like white supremacist terrorism in this country. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, right. and, and I, to me, those things can't, can't be separated until there's like some meaningful form of, of restitution in that regard. So, sure. you know, I, to, to me again, it's like, okay, but there, you know, there are plenty of women of color in this community. There are plenty of men of color that aren't being <laughs> accused of things. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, you can like go and sit down with those people and have a conversation because like accountability is valid. Like that is a valid thing to want and and demand, frankly. Um, but like you, you making yourself like the, 
whoever. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's like, no, this needs to be, I mean, generally speaking, I think that restitution needs to be collaborative anyway. Like there needs to be more than like the two parties involved. Sure. Yeah. Like it, it's almost a community thing, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Truly. So I think that it's, yeah, the like white vigilantism of like holding, holding black Muslim men accountable. I was just kind of like, okay, but I don't, this is, this is just, it feels off, right. Because of the way that that has been so yeah. misused. Right. Um, Oh, that sounds fair to me. <laughs> yeah. That seems like reasonable uh, perspective. I, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I, like, obviously I'm a white dude. So I, I try to, when, when stuff like that's going on, I do try to like, listen as much as I can right. instead of just inserting myself. But <laughs> like, Hey, I have an opinion. <laughs> no, really. Do you? <laughs> I always, I, I do always have an opinion. <laughs> But usually I try to be informed by, uh, yeah, yeah, Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. And I, you know, again, it's like, this is not like we, we have to, we have to find a, a productive way to hold people accountable for their behavior. And I am, you know, I fully support that. And, you know, but, but I think that, yeah, once you start falling back on like these kind of racist tropes in order to like make a point, right, right. Yeah. That's where to me it gets questionable. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's it's like anything I guess like you have to instead of doing the quick reaction. Yeah. Be thoughtful, try mm-hmm. and you know, try and look at it from a couple of perspectives and mm-hmm. and like, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. So and- uh, if you have something else to add, I'll, oh. I'll, I'll listen. Um, oh my gosh. Oh, like the, the thing, the thing that I was just going to say is it's like, um, I, it's like fighting on fighting people on Twitter. Isn't, isn't accountability. <laughs> Are you sure? Cause I'm everybody like, feels like, I feel, is. I feel, I feel like sad that I have to say this. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, yeah. like again, in, in our particular situations, like these are all people that live like walking distance from each other. Like get off the goddamn computer and go talk to this person. Right. right. Yeah. And, but instead it's just like, they're all just like blocking each other. It's like, okay, well that went well. Thanks. Well, what's going to happen when you walk down the street though? <laughs> like if you meet them in the grocery store, are you going to just ignore them? Like, Great question. <laughs> I don't like, yeah, it's like, and it's like all these people are doing good work, right? Like all these people are doing really good work. And it's like, we're spending all of our time and emotional energy just to like end up blocking somebody. Like that's not, I, I, you know, I have in like in certain situations, I have, I have called people, like called people up. I have like asked, you know, I've emailed people. Like if I'm like, I don't do conflict resolution on Twitter. I'm sorry. Like that is ineffective. And it's like, it's just like my nervous system reaction. It's not even me using my brain to process what's going on. (laughs) So it's like, when you get offline and you actually have a conversation with someone, it's very different. I bet. Yeah. It's uh, conflict resolution on Twitter seems like de-escalation with a gun. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. That's amazing. I love this. So good. All right. Uh, so uh, you don't have anybody here, but do you have some comrades that you'd like to shout out for doing a great work or something? Oh my gosh. Okay. So the person whose work I'm really kind of obsessing over, enjoying lately. Um, I mean, like there's obviously there's very cool, like local folks like we have a lot of cool activists in portland and and journalists and what have you um but yeah right now i have been on a kick um of trying to like get my hands ears on everything that margaret killjoy does oh like yeah yeah i absolutely she's awesome yeah i I love (laughs) her and like i don't i don't know she's like she started following me and i was like well, because I, mean, I tw- like what I did was I tweeted. I was like, how I'm like, how the fuck do I have more followers than she does? Like, this is I'm like, go fix this. And then and then she like followed me because of that, um, which is not like it, it's not like a 
name dropping, like humble brag sort of thing. It was very much like I made a complete fool of myself on Twitter being like, <laughs> oh, also I have a crush on you. So, um, you know, perfect. that's, that's oh, how, that's, that's how I roll on the internet. Unfortunately, <laughs> like if I have a Twitter crush on you, I'm going to tell you to your face. We've been trying to work out a, a time and, and date so that Margaret can come on the show, actually. Oh, that makes me so happy. Yes, I think that she is wonderful and thoughtful and brilliant and challenging. Um, yeah, I wish I wish we were IRL friends. <laughs> Perfect. That's awesome. That's probably the best comrade shout out that I've had on the show so far. Oh, really? Oh, good. I'm so proud. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> that makes me happy. All right. So I guess we're coming up at the end of the hour. Where can people find your stuff? Mm, yeah. Okay. So um, like we talked about, uh, I have White Homer podcast. You can get that anywhere. Go home Bible, you're drunk. You can also get that anywhere. Um, and then like socials for that, it's just at White Homework on Twitter and Instagram, at Go Home Bible on Twitter and Instagram. It's very, very like straightforward there. Um I am usually on my bullshit on Twitter <laughs> at Sorry Glass, usually. Um, you know, I sometimes use my IG account as well. I don't even know how you're supposed to like tell people to find you on TikTok. So good luck. Um, <laughs> I think it's an at like, like, right? like, I'm doing... <laughs> like who's, who's in charge of this? Like how do what's, what's my address here? I don't yeah. know. Um, TikTok.com. <laughs> <slash. laughs> no. Um, my website is just at, Tory Glass. And um, so I put a lot of my essays on there. It's that's a little bit more of like a formal version of me as Very opposed cool. to like the absolute chaos that you will see on Twitter. But um, yeah, I do like I do a lot of consulting, I guess, for people like with like anti-racism and like and and folks like trying to build um, like build reparations into their company. Nice, right. Nice. Um, and so, which I like, I love doing, but just so, you know, like you can read my stuff on there. It's all on there. Um, cool. and then, yeah, if you want to help pay the rent for a family of color, you can just go to whitehomework.com and that is my Patreon and you can just join pay the rent club and yeah, we can make life easier for a family for a year, which is a really big deal. Great. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. So go do that. Yes. <laughs> any, any viewers slash wish listeners, go do that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or ratemypodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical court. You can find all my social media stuff there, as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist, Humanist, Leftist, Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves. <laughs>